Hey guys, what's up? PBM here. Today I'm going to be talking about item builds in Season 4, mainly for supports. Actually, pretty much only for supports. And going over what new items I think are good and strong. I know this video is a little late. I wanted to get it out a bit earlier, but I wasn't really sure what I felt about all the items. And now that I have played a few weeks on uh, this patch and played a few weeks of Season 4 and kind of scrimmed and got a feel for all this stuff, and SPL is coming up, I think I have a better grasp or a better grasp on uh, what items I like the most and why. So screw all that stuff. Let's get into it. Uh, first item are your starters. Watcher's gift is still by far the best support option in the game for starting a game. I think it really isn't even close anymore. Uh, this item got buffed. It has protections on it now, and the rewards you get uh, you get more gold, you get more health, you get more mana than you used to. This item is just insane. You should be getting it every single game that you're playing support, in my opinion. Other starter items that you could consider getting, if you want to try to clear the jungle a little bit faster, you could consider getting a Bumba's Mask, but this is normally not the thing you want to go to. I have it in my God Builder uh, in case I end up jungling and ranked, honestly, and I end up playing like Jungle Athena or Jungle Ymir. Other starter items you could consider are... Uh, I'm not sure why it's not here, but... Oh, there we go. Swiftwing. I'm not sure why it doesn't show up here, but only here. Whatever. Screw that. Uh, Swiftwing is another option that you can look to towards starter items now. Anything after Bumbas and Watchers, I don't think you really want to leave level 1 out of base with uh, in the support role. But items like Swiftwing, like Vanguard, and like Sands of Time, you can consider buying for a quick power spike throughout the rest of the game. I think of the three, the weakest in my opinion is Vanguard. Uh, the reason for this is that now that there are more aura items to build, I don't find the 800 gold power spike that Vanguard gives uh, worth it as much as it was in Season 3. And likewise, now that Watchers gives you protections uh, for buying that item, I don't find the props that Vanguard gives as valuable. You still want to get this item if you're against like an Ares or an Anubis or something where the passive is going to mitigate a lot of dot damage. But in most situations, I find Vanguard to be pretty underwhelming, and I've kind of been looking past it. Uh, similar to Sands of Time, it can be really good. There are certain gods that come to mind like Terra, uh, like Geb, stuff like that that really value that cooldown. Uh, especially Terra, who also struggles with her mana. Gods like that can be very good with Sands of Time. You could also look to use this one, something like a Sylvanas, who can pump out healing and then have extra mana regeneration and cooldown reduction on those heals. Overall, I wouldn't look to buy this every game, but it's definitely an item you could consider. And then my favorite one of the starter items is Swiftwing. I've messed around with this item in scrims a lot, and I don't think it's a buy every game sort of thing. Uh, if you've watched my stream, you've probably noticed that I buy it a good amount. And the reason for that is this movement speed is an insane stat. Uh, it's very valuable at, through all stages of the game, especially the early game, which is when you would be buying a starter item, uh, because you're rotating more jungle camps earlier in the game. There's less team fighting, less grouping, and it's more you spreading out across the map and trying to go camp to camp and secure everything for your team. And if you have more movement speed, you can do that. I think Swiftwing is better when you're invading rather than when you're behind in the game. If you're using the Swiftwing passive to try to get to the enemy jungle and invade as quick as possible, then it becomes very valuable to you because your time that you have to back is so tight because you have to be able to get your normal farm and secure your own camps and then also have the time to back and make it to the enemy camps, which sometimes can be impossible without this item. So I like messing with Swiftwing. I'm not sure if it's great or not, but it, it has a ton of potential and I would recommend that everybody tries it for themselves. After your starter items, you go ahead and go into boots. So, the options you can go for boots are pretty much all good. I think pen boots are generally the weakest because they're the most expensive, and they give you stats that don't really synergize with all the support gods. Cooldown shoes, of course, are very good. They're kind of the luxury option. If you can get away with this and not feel, uh, and not feel too squishy, then they're very nice. The early game mana is also very valuable, so cooldown shoes are definitely something to look into. And then Reinforced Greaves are also very good, same as they were in Season 3. They just make you a lot tankier. The crowd control reduction is great. Early health is great. All that stuff is good. And my personal f uh, favorite shoes in Season 4 are Traveler Shoes. If any of you have kind of paid attention to 
uh, my Twitter and my Twitch over the past couple years. I've been in the Pro League. You'll know that historically I hate Traveler shoes. I think they're completely overrated and pretty much garbage is what I used to call them. Uh, my opinion changes on them this season, not because they were buffed or anything like that. In fact, they were actually nerfed because now something like an Athena Taunt won't proc the passive, only damage will proc the passive. And even through that, I still think they're the best shoes. The reason for that, one, they're the cheapest options along with reinforced shoes in the game. And two, movement speed is OP on this map. Movement speed allows you to get to all the camps as fast as possible. And I find that going fast on this map ends up giving me a lot more rewards than it previously would because there are more jungle camps on the map currently in Season 4 than there were in Season 3 and even in Season 2. So I value the movement speed a lot more, and I like to move uh, to and from uh, lanes quicker, to get to camps quicker, and to get out of base quicker as well. So I, I value Travelers a ton, and the HP 5 is also very valuable in those boots and something that you can look to take advantage of the early game sustain. Uh, moving on past that are your aura items. So, Sovereignty and Heart Ward were remained, unt remained untouched, but Gauntlet of Thieves is the new aura item. It gives you protections of both magical and physical. It's very strong. I've seen a lot of people try to rush Gauntlet of Thieves. I personally don't think that's the best option for a couple reasons. One, you're most likely going to be against three physical gods and two magical gods, where one of the two magical gods is the support. So, having equal magical to physical protections normally isn't as valuable as vice versa, or not as vice versa, as uh, just stacking physical procs early, which is why I think Sav is still the best item to rush. Uh, Sav also has the added benefit of giving HP 5 to your entire team, rather than Thebes only giving HP 5 to yourself. It seems like a small deal, but uh, HP 5 in and out of combat is actually the same in Smite, whereas in other games you gain le uh, less HP 5 in combat than you would out of combat. So basically that HP 5 in fight uh, equates to you healing any teammate around you 5 health per second. So that adds up a lot in extended engagements, it adds up when you're just clearing waves, it adds up when you're clearing jungle camps. You give your whole team a lot more sustain, and also your tankier to dive towers or tank gold fury, and let your teammates make more plays around you being tankier to objective. So I still value sovereignty the highest, it also gives 30 physical prot compared to the 20 physical prot of Thebes, and it's 50 gold cheaper so you get an extra normal word if you don't buy Chalice, but we'll go over that later. Uh, so yeah, I still think Sovereignty is the strongest. I think Thebes is the second strongest aura item. And then Heart Word after that. The reason I think Heart Word is generally weak is because the aura is the worst of all three because it gives you only 20 magical prots, which is the same as Thebes. However, uh, Thebes also gives you physical prots, whereas Heart Word gives you MP5, which isn't as valuable as HP5 in most cases. And also just... In general, Heart Ward doesn't really feel great to build because often, like I said, you'll be against two ma uh, comps that only have two magical characters, one of which will be the enemy support. So you're not really tanky to the rest of the map if you rush a Heart Ward. Uh, and also, the other items in the Heart Ward tree, such as Pestilence, are actually very strong compared to the tree that Sovereignty is in, uh, giving you, like, you know, Emperor's Armor and Mid Guardian Mail and Mystical Mail. Uh, comparatively, Sovereignty is the best item in this tree, so if you were to build kind of a health and defense item, then generally Pestilence could even be better than Heart Ward, so it's per it's not a bad item. Building these three auras every game is a good build. Uh, you can look to other options if you want to fit more CDR in or whatever, but in terms of what are the strongest auras, in my opinion, it's Sovereignty, then Thebes, then Heart Ward. Uh, moving on past that, we'll go over some items that have pretty much remained unchanged from Season 3 into Season 4 and were built quite often on support, which is Wingblade, which was completely untouched. Same item, we have all grown to know. Nothing to really go over there. Spirit Robe, also the same item, however, it had its price increased by 40 gold from 2460 to 2500. Not a big deal, but still something to note. Uh, still a great passive, great selfish option for support. If you're worried about getting CC comboed and killed, Spirit Robe is just as good as it's pretty much ever been. Here are the new items for Season 4, so Stone of Gaia, Shogun's Kisari, Spectral Armor, Jade Emperor's Crown, Void Stone, and Stone of Binding. All new items. Uh, we'll go over Stone of Binding first, so... You can consider these kind of the offensive options to the previous aura items. So if you consider Sovereignty, Heart Ward, and Thebes your normal defensive auras, then Stone of Binding, Void Stone, and Jade Emperor's Crown are kind of the, the anti-aura items, so... 
Void Stone is probably the most obvious. It pretty much completely negates the Heart Word passive. Heart Word gives 20 procs, Void Stone reduces 20 procs around enemies, or uh, to enemies around the person that has the Void Stone. A Void Stone also gives you 5 more magical protection than Heart Word does. Heart Word gives you 45 plus 20 for a total of 60, whereas Void Stone gives you 70. That was actually buffed going into Season 4. Uh, from 60 to 70 prots on Voidstone, and of course it gives you magical power. Another thing to note about Voidstone is it is also stronger in your 6 item builds, and your full builds, because if you get Sovereignty plus Thebes, you're stacking a lot of health, so it's nice to get a little bit of magical power and an aggressive aura in there. Like Voidstone, it balances out your build really nicely. You don't want to stack too much health, because if you stack too much health, you end up becoming very squishy, and uh, effects like Soul Reaver, effects like Ethereal Staff, can really just kill you like instantly, and you don't want to play into those too hard as both of those are pretty solid items for mages. Uh, going back to Stone of Binding, even though it doesn't say Aura in the tooltip, and if you're playing something like Ares, you won't really be able to have the benefit from your passive, or really just be able to use this item at all actually, because it only works off hard crowd control. It kind of is the anti-Thebes, and the reason I say that is that uh, if you see a support rushing boots into Thebes, and you choose to rush Boots into Stone of Binding, you'll get your Power Spike 450 gold quicker. You'll get more protections for yourself. So the person who buys Thebes will only get 20 of each prot. You'll get 30. Of course, you won't have the health, but you'll have magical power off Stone of Binding, and whenever you CC anyone, your teammates gain more protection. So if you're around... Or more penetration, excuse me. So if you're around three teammates, including yourself, you're one of the three, and you... Athena taunts somebody, you Ymir freeze them, you Bacchus flop them, you Sylvanas root them, you Sylvanas alt them, Geb shockwave, all that stuff, you give your entire team penetration, so you give your team a total of 30 penetration and an aura, which is why I consider it an aura item, and it can be very good for making aggressive plays. Overall, it's tricky where to build Stone of Binding, because generally you would rather have a defensive aura than offensive, because you have more control over it, and like I said, the HP 5 from Sovereignty uh, generates passive value, so you could be doing nothing, you could be sitting in a lane, and Sovereignty is still helping your team because it helps you, uh, you know, it just helps you regen, it helps you sustain, it helps you not take much damage from minion camps, which while it seems like a small deal, can add up, and Stone of Binding, if you're not doing anything, does nothing for your team, which is why you would generally look to the defensive auras, but still a very strong option. Uh, Jade, Emperor, Jade Emperor's Crown is the kind of anti-sovereignty. It's a little different than Voidstone is, though, because Voidstone reduces protection. Jade Emperor's Crown is instead reducing power, so this item doesn't actually counter Sov, kind of like Voidstone does to Heartward. Instead, it kind of is just like there. Uh, this item, I don't think is great on supports most of the time. It is when you get later in your build after you're done these other aura items. Uh, I think this is a very strong jungle or soul lane guardian item to pick up. It's really good for bruisers, gives you every stat you would want, physical prop, magical power, health, and you take less damage because they have less power. Really good item. It's a little bit over-budgeted in my opinion. I think 2150 is a little too expensive. I think if you saw this item at about 2,000 gold, uh, you would probably see it picked up a little bit more, but still a very strong item when it uh, gets value out of the passive. Moving on to Shogun's, this is another new aura item. This item is unique for a few reasons. One, it's another aggressive aura that this time increases attack speed, so it is it is the only aura in the game that isn't influencing protections or power. Instead, it's just giving your teammates attack speed, so it's very unique for that. It's also unique because it gives both cooldown and crowd control reduction, crowd control reduction, and it's one of two items in the entire game that do that, and the other one is uh, Spirit Robe, which costs 100 more gold and doesn't have an aura. Generally, uh, you can tell by that logic right there that it's cheaper, has extremely well-rounded stats, and gives an aura. I think this item, in most situations, is stronger than Spirit Robe. Like I said, if you need the passive from Spirit Robe to stay alive in teamfights, obviously this item is way, way, way better than Shogun's. Uh, but Shogun's is a very interesting item to me. Another thing to kind of talk about is similar to how I was saying Sovereignty can generate value for your en entire team while you're doing nothing, you're just farming because of the HP 5. Shogun's actually does the same, because while you're farming, you're increasing your entire team's farm speed, because they're auto-attacking quicker, so junglers get more val- it's- it's- this is really small min-max stuff, by the way, this is not the reason to build the item. 
but it generates a lot of value over time because you're clearing quicker, you're clearing waves quicker, you're clearing jungle camps quicker, you can burn objectives quicker, you can kill Gold Fury, Portal Demon extremely quick with this item, you can siege towers a lot more efficiently. Shogun's, in my opinion, is one of the most underrated items this season. Uh, I think it generally is just insanely strong, and I'm not sure why people don't pick it up more. Just my opinion, though. The weakness to this item is that you do lack prots and health compared to going some other builds where you would go, you know, Thebes, Heartward, Sovereignty, or pick up a Spirit Robe, stuff like that. But gaining the cooldown reduction and crowd control is very valuable, because if you take a look at all the items I have here, there's only two of them that give you cooldown reduction, and that is Shogun's and Spirit Robes, so... Finding a place to build those stats is very nice. Moving on to Spectral Armor. So this item actually f went under a lot of changes. Uh, it got nerfed a lot in PTS. It previously was just insanely OP. Basically, whenever you take physical damage from a god, enemies within 30 units are feared. This happens once every 90 seconds, which is the same internal cooldown of Stone of Gaia, which we'll get to in a second. So physical god hits you, hunter auto-attacks you, hun bots alts you, they get feared off of you. You, when you buy this item, you want to make sure that you're not getting auto-attacked by a hunter, and you're not letting people poke this uh, passive off of you for free, because then you lose a lot of value from this item. For 2100 gold, this item does kind of have sufficient stats just for the cost. If you look at Nemean, for example, it's 80 physical prop for 2200 gold, and Spectral is 70 physical prop for 2100 gold, but it also gives you the 20% crowd control reduction. So generally, Spectral will make you tank will make you tankier than Anemian would. Uh, so it's all about value in the passives and stuff like that. Breastplate of Valor, uh, while we're in this tree, is still a very good option. A lot of CDR, the protections on it were actually reduced from Season 3 to Season 4 just slightly. So you are a little squishier when you build this item, but... Overall, still the best CDR item in the game in terms of just rushing CDR as quick as you possibly can. Uh, to go, to backtrack a little bit when we talk about Breastplate, if you compare Breastplate to Sands of Time, and this is why I say you should consider building Sands of Time in the middle of your build, Breastplate is 2300 gold for 20% CDR, so if you're only buying this item to rush cooldown, and you don't really care about the physical prot, which sometimes you may not have to, because if you're building it for physical prot, other items will make you t make you tankier than breastplate. Uh, so instead of spending 2300 for 20% CDR, you could spend 800 for 10% CDR, which is a lot more cost efficient. You also get the magical power. So if you really value the physical protection from breastplate, then sure go that. But if you're just looking to get in some cost efficient CDR, that's why you would buy Sands of Time. Uh, anyways, moving on to where we were, next is stone, or actually I should go over some implications of Spectral Armor. This item absolutely farms Loki. Lokis cannot kill you if you have this passive up, they will alt you, they will instantly get feared, they can't apply their dot to you, uh, they'll get CC'd out of their stealth if they choose to alt stealth and then auto attack you. It makes it a pain in the ass for Lokis to try to kill you, there are other gods that have this type of interaction, a Thor lands on you, gets feared off of you. A Humbot alt gets feared off of you. Stuff like that make this item very, very strong, so it's very important to preserve your passive and s be able to proc it when you need it most. Similar to Stone of Gaia, this item has a ton of potential to counter entire comps. A comp you would see very often in Season 3 was Sobek plus a Wheelix plus Burst Mage, so something like a Ra, a Scylla, a Ryzen, stuff like that and the Sobek would just pluck or knock you up with his Tail Whip, and then the Awilix would pull you. This item completely stops that combo, they cannot do that. You're immune to knockups, pulls, grabs, knockbacks, while you have this passive uh, available to you and it doesn't get poked out, all that good stuff. Uh, it also works against Sylvanas' pull, it works against both of Herc's abilities, Kuzumbo is a new god, it works against his abilities, and also you get the old Stone of Gaia stats, you get a lot of regen. This item is overall very strong in situations where it makes sense. Gauntlet of Thebes is still the best item in this tree, and Stone of Gaia gets a little bit worse, because if you go both Thebes and Gaia, you have too much health with too little prot, so be very careful of that. But Stone of Gaia overall is a very good item. Magi's Blessing kind of has simple or similar implications. Spectral counters physical god initiations, like a Humbot Salt. Uh, Stone of Gaia counters knockback initiations, so stuff like Sobek, stuff like Herc, 
And Magi's could counter everything else, could counter Athena Taunt, can counter your Mirror Freeze, whereas these two items would not. These item, all three of these items, you should be looking at what situations they will get the most value. And if there are situations where these passives can counter an entire enemy's comp, then you should actually absolutely build these items. Uh, they're just insane. And in a lot of cases, Magi's is probably regarded as the weakest of the three, and Spectral is probably the strongest of the three. Uh, but still very strong items. We already went over Breastplate Pestilence. No change from Season 3 to Season 4. Very good. Healing was actually mass nerfed in Season 4. Every god with healing had their numbers nerfed by a very little bit. So Pestilence on top of that makes healers very weak. You also could look to get Pestilence instead of Heartward. Uh, pestilence is even good if they only have one meditation, especially if they have two meditations. If you just counter a meditation, Pestilence can be worth it. So, definitely still a very strong item. Emperor's Armor. I have this here for times where you have comps, when you have like a Freya or something where you can't really siege all that well. Generally, Emperor's Armor is weak, but if you're in comps that are going to be dictated by the win, or the winner and loser is going to be dictated by who sieges or defends sieges the best, then Emperor's Armor can be an option that you look towards, but... Generally, it's the weakest item in my entire god builder of what I have here, and I have every tree represented here, so should say a lot. Uh, Chalice of the Oracle. You should buy this every single game. Why should you buy this every single game? If you back and you're buying two normal wards, which you're going to do anyways, that costs you 100 gold. So if you back and you buy Chalice, you get the same two normal wards, but instead of pay paying 100 gold, you spend 400. So you're actually spending an extra 300 gold for this chalice that will refill which means if you back three times then this item pays for itself because you're gonna get eight wards and six of them you basically don't have to buy uh, or six of them you don't have to buy because it'll just refresh any wards past eight that you get from this chalice you're just making money off of the item you're saving gold and you can invest that into more items you can invest that into more centuries you can invest that into more rituals which we'll go over in a second all that good stuff uh you should buy this as pretty much as early as you comfortably can every single game this item is absolutely insane century wards still really good they're still the best word in the game uh i generally value cent one century is generally more valuable than two normal words However, one buying your chalice takes precedent over buying a century ward, in my opinion. So, in order, you want to st uh, start the game out with your watchers, get whatever else you want at your start, finish your boots, get your chalice, then start pumping out centuries, and then start building into your other items. That's my opinion on how to kind of curve out your build throughout a game. You can mess with that here and there and change it game to game, but generally that's what's worked the best for me. Healing potions, these really only apply when you're starting out a game. So when you start a game, you generally want to start Watcher's Gift, you want to start Boots 1, and then you want to go... I like to go... F oh, crap, I missed a little arrow. I like to go 4 Health Potions and 3 Multi Potions. The reason I like to do this is Watcher's regenerates a lot of, ma or a lot of mana if you're just passively getting assist on creeps and you're not last hidden. Uh, so you get a lot more mana from Watcher's already. And multi potions help you box and lane a little bit more. The other start you could look to go, and this is something I've been messing with, is you can go Watcher's Gift, and then you can start your Chalice right away, and then you can get four health potions, and you just skip the three multi potions for the Chalice, and you don't get Boots one. This start will leave you a uh, hundred gold left over, so that when you back, instead of need. If you have Boots 1, say you want to finish it into Traveler's Shoes, you need 1,100 gold on your first back to finish your Boots. With this Chalice Start, you need 1,400 gold to finish your Boots, but you already have 100 left over, so you only need 1,300 gold, and you already have your Chalice. So you can spend your gold a little bit more efficiently because you're not wasting them, you know, quote-unquote, wasting them on these Multi Potions. So if you don't think you need the Multi Potions, look towards trying that start. Uh, and then lastly, we can go over rituals. So, rituals are generally just really, really, really strong. Frenzied is probably the best of the four in terms of getting consistent value for your 750 gold. Uh, something to preface the talk about rituals there 
they all have risk because they're all consumables. They all cost 750. However, the effects are so strong that it is very rare that you don't get your 750 gold worth of this item. So, for example, Frenzied Ritual, it can be used to burn Gold Furies. It can be used to burn Towers. It can be used to burn Fire Giants. If you're behind and you can't afford a full item, you should probably look toward... And you know a team fight's about to come. So, say you're, say you're about to fight over a Gold Fury and you're about to have a big 5v5 team fight and you can't afford to finish an aura item, rather than upgrading that item from tier 1 to tier 2, or even just buying the tier 1, a lot of times it's better to just buy a frenzied ritual, try to win that fight, and a lot of times the frenzy will win the fight for you. Uh, and then, yeah, you kind of just generate value off of that, and you get gold for your entire team by winning fights. So, if you can't tell, I think these rituals are absolutely busted. A lot of pro players are very concerned with the state of game uh, with rituals only because they have such massive potential to break the game they're just so strong uh so you definitely want to consider buying these every game flickering ritual is probably the second best ritual this allows you to combat blink you can make a lot of really good plays this is less for support and more overall strength i think flickering is the second best uh as for support you can make good plays with this you could be like you know maybe you're sylvanas and the other team keeps trying to go on you all game Maybe you can have them engage on you, and then you survive the engage, and then you combat blink into their team, and then you alt their team and turn the engagement. You can make a lot of really cool plays like that. Rallying Ritual is TP to Gods. You can cheese a ton of games like this. You can get back into fights when you have no business being there. Teleport is just an insane ability, so to have it on a ritual is just absolutely nuts. And then Revealing Ritual... Generally the weakest of the four, but it's still really good. It tells it's basically a, a new wall alt that also reveals wards around the person who pops the ritual. So for example, say you have a Janus on your team and you're looking to engage on the enemy when you're baiting a fire giant, you just pop revealing ritual and you alt through all the walls to whoever is by themselves or to wherever the enemy team is, and you kill them and there's very little they can do about it. Lots of strong stuff you can do with this, so definitely try to consider when you should buy Rituals overall, they're just very strong. And then relics actually are last. I forgot to go over relics. Uh, relics are generally the same as they were in Season 3 in terms of what you're picking up most games. Shell, still very good. Heavenly, still very good. However, Heavenly now does not make you immune to slows. It only cleanses slows at the very start. And then when you upgrade this, it gives your entire team the Fatalis effect. They don't have auto attack penalties, so... This is very good for comps where you have multiple uh, AD carries, or if you have something like a Mercury or a Kali, any auto attack assassin, this item can get a lot of value from it when you upgrade it. Cursed Ankh uh, is generally weaker than Weakening Curse was. The healing reduction is lower, and it doesn't have a slow on it. This relic is overall pretty crap compared to what it used to be. But when you upgrade it, it the duration of the anti-heal goes to 15 seconds, which can be very tricky for healers because there's no way to remove that. Uh, so if you're against multiple healers or even if you're against one god who's healing a ton and giving you a ton of problems, uh, Cursed On can be very good. I don't think you want to look at Aegis towards support. Hog is generally weak. I would ignore both of those. I would ignore Beads as well. And as support, I would ignore tele uh, Teleport. Blink, same old Blink that it's been for years. You know what gods it, it's good on, good on Geb, good on Ymir, good on stuff like that. When you upgrade it, you reduce the cooldown so you can blink more. That's awesome. Uh, going on to Meditation, same as it was in Season 3. However, when you upgrade it, you also gain regeneration for a little bit of time. I think it's like 30 seconds. So, overall, very strong. Shell, same thing. It, got, it did get nerfed, but when you upgrade it, it goes to 45 protections to all units instead of... Uh, 35, and then the damage taken reduction is from 5% to 10%, so still very good. Thorns, more of a soul lane item. I wouldn't really look at getting this as support. Sunder lets you make some pretty sick plays. Uh, really, really good this season. Not really a support relic, but it can be very good. Phantom Veil, when it can get value out of getting your team out of Ymir walls, Odin walls, stuff like that. Uh, Odin Cage, I should say. This item can be very good. It also gives your team crowd control and knockup immunity. So, or crowd control reduction and knockup immunity. So it's very good to counter hard CC tanky comps. The downside of this relic is that it's 180 seconds. So generally, 
it's weaker than something like a shell or like a meditation, but it can be very good. Horrific Emblem is basically old and feebling curse. The slow from weakening curse that is now cursed Ankh was moved on to Horrific Emblem. So this item gives you your slow and it gives you the attack speed reduction. This is very good against comps with multiple AD carries or reverse Kali, Merc, stuff like that. And then Bracer of Undoing. Uh, this is an interesting item. It's kind of like a selfish meditation in terms of healing yourself. The added benefit to this item is that it burst heals a lot harder. So, for example, say you have, say you just got Kraken in a team fight, and it took you down to 25. It took you from 100% HP down to 40% HP. If you pop Bracer, then you'll go from 40% to 70%, and you'll reduce all your cooldowns by three seconds. Uh, you can make a lot of really, really good plays with this item, but generally team fight relics are just more valuable for support, and that's what I would look to buy. More games than not, you want to look to buy Shell, Meditation, Heavenly Wings, Cursed Ankh, and Horrific Emblem, and then Blink on Gods where it does well. And overall, that's pretty much it. That should be everything you guys need to know about builds and items in Season 4. There are a lot more intricate stuff and a lot more cool plays you can make but that would just make the video so long so I'm not really going to go through that so test everything for yourself this is generally what you want to look towards building there are some items I didn't really go over in depth that should be pretty self-explanatory such as you know relic dagger if you're using something like blink you probably want to use this to reduce your blink cooldown so you can gauge more stuff like that yeah of course it can be good which blade more soul lane item than support? You can build it, but I would generally try to get your soul laner to build it before you. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Just try everything out for yourselves. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Please give me any comments and feedback on how I can make this stuff better, or any other questions you might have. And I hope you guys enjoyed. Have a good one.